Thank you, Seth, and good morning. Good to see all of you here. We are in the book of Joshua, and this morning we're looking at chapter 4. The Lord has given Joshua instruction in chapter 3 on the crossing of the Jordan, and that has taken place. And when we read that chapter last week, he noticed in, chapter, in verse 12, the Lord said, Now take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one for each tribe. But there was no explanation given for why Joshua was to do that. Well, we find the explanation in our passage in chapter 4. I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's a long chapter, but we won't be dealing with every verse in our exposition. So follow along, beginning with verse 1. Now, when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, <clears throat> the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up the twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan just as the Lord spoke to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. For the priests who carried the Ark were standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed. And when all the people had finished crossing, the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over in battle array before the sons of Israel, just as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 equipped for war crossed for battle before the Lord of, to the desert plain of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests who carry the ark of the testimony that they come up from the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, saying, Come up from the Jordan. It came about when the priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come up from the middle of the Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted to the dry ground, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and went over all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Those twelve stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, 
When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. And I'm going to end with the first verse of chapter 5. Now it came about that all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed, that their hearts melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in prayer. One thing it seems that great cities have in common is impressive monuments. They're often in a central location and usually commemorate great achievements on the battlefield. The Arc de Triomphe in Paris was commissioned by Napoleon after his victory at Austerlitz. Trafalgar Square in London celebrates Admiral Nelson's naval victory in the Napoleonic Wars. Washington, D.C. is full of monuments honoring battles and wars that were won. That's what men do. They venerate their triumphs. They've done that since the pharaohs. So maybe it's not surprising that the first thing Israel did when the nation entered the land of Canaan was build a monument. In fact, they built two monuments. But it was no boast on their greatness or their achievements. In fact, these monuments were entirely unimpressive. They were a pile of rocks. In fact, one of the two was placed at the bottom of the Jordan River, hidden from sight. They were about God, not man, and built to remind people of His greatness. The circle had closed. God brought Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand. He parted the Red Sea. He brought the people to the other side on dry ground and drowned their enemy when it pursued them. Now, 40 years later, the Lord divided the Jordan River and led the nation on dry ground into Canaan. He freed them from slavery and He gave them a land of their own, the promised land. It was all the Lord's doing. The stones were piled up to remind the people of His great miracle of bringing them into the land. In fact, in verse 3, people are instructed to take 12 rocks from the river and lay them down in their camp. But the word lay is not the usual word for to set or to put it's the word rest. It's unusual. Literally, it means cause them to rest. And it seems to be an intentional reference to what the Lord would do. He would give Israel rest in Canaan. It's a picture of that. It's a picture of salvation rest. That's what the monument of rocks was intended to remind Israel of. The Lord... God commanding His people to rest in Canaan, giving them rest in the promised land. It was all His doing, His work as the sovereign Savior. He's one that we can trust in. And that's really the lesson of this passage. It's the message of the rocks. Chapter 4 begins, When all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord, we're told, gave instruction to Joshua to set up a memorial to this 
great miraculous event. Twelve men, one from each tribe, were to take a stone from the riverbed of the Jordan and place it where the, the, the priests had, uh, had been. They received, they take those rocks that, from that place and they lay them down in the, uh, the site where the, the camp would rest and be on the west side of the Jordan. We read in verses 4 and 5, So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God, into the middle of the Jordan. And each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. The, uh, the site of the camp is Gilgal. We know that because in verse 20 we read those twelve stones which they had taken from the Jordan. Joshua set up at Gilgal. In verses 6 and 7, Joshua explains that the, uh, the stones were to be for a witness to that miracle that had taken place at the Jordan. Uh, let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the rivers of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. So the, son, the stones were both a, a sign and a memorial for Joshua's generation and for the generations to follow forever, he said. Now, sign is a pointer. That word is used, that, that's used here in verse 6 is often used of miracles. They are signs. It was used, for example, in the book of Exodus of the miracles that God did in Egypt. They pointed to God's power and judgment. Here, the stones taken from the Jordan were signs pointing to His power and salvation. They were a witness to His faithfulness in keeping the promises that He had made, and to His power in overcoming any obstacle to those promises. The Jordan River, even at flood stage, could not prevent the Lord from fulfilling His promise and bringing Israel into the land. Well, that's the God that we worship. That's the God of the prophets. That's the God that Isaiah proclaimed in Isaiah 14, verse 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand. And then the prophet goes on to say in verse 27, For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Well, of course, those are rhetorical questions, and the point is no one can turn it back. The Lord cannot be frustrated. He cannot be stopped. What He plans to do, He does. And those stones were there to speak of that, to speak of His sovereignty, to point to it. They were a sign. Each stone made a memorial to each of the tribes of what the Lord had done. Not one tribe had been left out. Each had been brought into its inheritance by the Lord. They um, were there for a purpose. They were there to uh, aid in reminding people of this great truth, as Joshua tells the people. Uh, this would occur. It would occur in part because of the children. It's very interesting. Children are naturally curious, and you know that if you have them or if you've been around them, they uh, um, find the most insignificant things to raise questions in their mind. And once they begin asking questions, it could be an endless stream of questions. Well, that's the nature of a child, and Israel's religion was designed to take advantage of that. At the Passover, the children would ask the question, what does this rite mean to you? And the father was to explain its meaning to them and to the family. 
So here the monument was set up in part to awaken curiosity in the children so that they would ask questions that would lead to instruction. So this is almost a kind of aid in catechizing the children. In verse 21 through verse 23, Joshua repeats his instruction to the fathers that when the children ask what the meaning of the stones is, they would explain that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan. So there's some emphasis here in this chapter placed on Israel remembering this event and perpetuating its memory. And an emphasis here is placed on fathers explaining things to their children. That's a major responsibility in Israel. We see that all through the scriptures. We see that particularly in the Pentateuch. Fathers were to teach their children the Bible, to teach their children the truth. Really, I don't want to limit it to fathers, parents. Fathers and mothers were to do that, but they were to be the teachers of their children, but particularly fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 6 states that. Moses instructs Israel to listen carefully to all the statutes of the law, it was the only way that they would, would learn to fear the Lord and the only way that they would prosper in the land. They needed to learn and obey the statutes, the law that the Lord had given. And then Moses gave the Shema, the great text of monotheism in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And then he told the fathers to teach their sons diligently. Teach them that. Teach all of the revelation that God had given to them. He writes, when you sit in your house and when you walk in the way and when you rise up and when you lie down. In other words, at every moment, every occasion, use that as a time to teach your children. About a hundred years ago, the British preacher Alexander McLaren criticized the parents of his day for not doing that, for leaving spiritual instruction to the Sunday schools. He wrote, the Jewish father was not to send his child to some Levite or other to get his question answered, but was to answer it himself. I'm afraid, McLaren said, that a good many English parents who call themselves Christians are too apt to say, ask your Sunday school teacher when such questions are put to them. He lamented what he called the decay of parental religious teaching in his day. Now, we appreciate greatly our Sunday school teachers. And uh, they work hard and they have a significant ministry and I think we have a very good Sunday school program, and it's a great thing for children to be in those Sunday school classes together, getting to know each other and learning the Word of God. But the Sunday school teacher is not a substitute or a surrogate for the parent. Sunday school teachers assist them. The best teacher a child can have is his or her father and mother. And that's biblical. That's Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, where both father and mother are to give instruction and the child is not to forget what they taught them. So you can imagine with that in mind how an, an Israelite family would be traveling and they travel by Gilgal. It's out of the way, so it would be an unusual place for them to be. But nevertheless, they would travel by this site and, and a son or a daughter would notice this curious pile of rocks and ask, Father or Abba, what is that? And the father would say, stones from the Jordan. God did a great miracle when we first came to this land. And then he would explain how God brought Israel out of Egypt and into Canaan. Years later, the children would pass on to their children, the same truth. And, and so it would go down through Israel's history. Children are not too young to be taught, and we should be teaching them at the earliest age. 
And so the, the so these stones were there for that purpose. They were there to aid in, in bringing to their mind, the mind of the people the things that God had done. They were there to help them to remember. But remembering involves more than simply recalling events to our minds. It, it involves, as one of the commentators put it, remembering with concern. And I take that to mean we not only remember the event, but that event that we remember should stimulate something within us with the result that we act upon it. We obey. And when they reflected on God's past gracious gift of Canaan, well, they were to be moved to gratefulness and faithfulness, obedience. It's always the purpose of God's memorials. In, in verse 9, we read of a second memorial that was set up. Nothing's recorded here about God giving uh, this instruction, but we, we would assume that he did and that Joshua didn't take it on himself to do this. But as the priest stood in the Jordan, jo Joshua set up 12 stones at the place where the, the feet of the priest carrying the ark were standing. And the stones, the text says, are there to this day. We probably should think, remember, understand that as to this day when the author was writing that, not necessarily to our day. Now, we can't help but, but wonder, in light of what the things I've just said, what practical value there could be for such a monument, one that's hidden underwater. How could that provoke a question? How could that cause reflection? But as long as the record of the event was kept alive, the people would know that it was there. Just as Israel would know that that ark that they saw before them in the Jordan River, but later was hidden within the Holy of Holies, was there. Seeing it or not seeing it didn't change the importance of it. And the knowledge of its presence there, the knowledge of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies would have given great comfort and assurance. The throne of the Lord was with Israel, and so too this memorial, these rocks hidden, but not necessarily by the fact that they're hidden, take away from their value, not at all. But even so, it, it, it probably wasn't hidden all the time. Francis Schaeffer wrote of a stone in Lake Geneva with the message inscribed on it, when you read this, weep. The point was that when the water of the lake got that low, the region was in a drought and the country was in trouble. Well, that may have been the same in Israel, a land that would experience droughts when God's discipline was on the nation. And as the waters became shallow, that memorial would become visible. And it would bring to remembrance these events and remind them of God's sovereignty over nature, His faithfulness to His promises, and the need to look to Him, to repent and trust in Him. I think there's a lesson in this for us. We should set up memorials. I don't mean visible memorials, but m memorials in the mind. We should remember what the Lord has done for us, how He has answered prayers. Remember occasions in our lives when, when He clearly intervened to, to do something for us, to rescue us. It's in incidences in our life that show His faithfulness to us. And Dr. Donald Campbell, who was uh, one of my professors at Dallas Theological Seminary and later president of the seminary, told an interesting story about Lewis Sperry Chafer, the founder and first president of the school. In the spring of 1924, when plans were being made to establish Dallas Seminary, Dr. Chafer was in Dundee, Scotland, the town where Robert Murray McShane had his short but very great ministry. Chafer was holding evangelistic meetings there at the invitation of a wealthy industrialist in the city, and he was a guest in the man's home. Well, one morning, 
Dr. Chafer woke up with a, a deep sense of anxiety about the future of the seminary and felt so overwhelmed with fear that it would fail that he got down on his knees and he prayed that God would show him his will. His fear was so strong that he decided that if God did not clearly show him what to do, that he would send a telegram to Dallas and request that plans be completely abandoned. Later at breakfast, he sat next to his host and was surprised when he asked Dr. Chafer if any provision had been made for the library at the seminary. Dr. Chafer answered that uh, there had not been any provision for that, and the wealthy businessman told him, go ahead and purchase the books and send the bill to me. And then he asked Dr. Chafer about his salary. Dr. Chafer said he didn't plan on taking a salary. Well, the man said he needed a salary, and he told him that, that he would take care of that also. Later, as Dr. Chafer recalled it, he said, truly, my cup ran over. Both provisions were gifts that he hadn't expected, hadn't asked for, and yet they were the answer of the prayer that he asked of the Lord to go forward with the seminary. Well, what it demonstrated to him clearly was God is faithful, and we should build memorials in our memory to how God has provided for us. He has provided for every one of us, more so than we realize, and we need to recall them. And you may not have an experience quite as remarkable as that as Dr. Chafer had, but we all are constantly the recipients of God's grace. Every breath of life that we take is a gift of God. Every moment of your existence is the will of God and His blessing on you. Often at night when I pray, I thank God for another day of life, a day with health, a day without pain. I thank Him for my wife. I thank Him for my family. You can go down a list of the things that, that we tend to take for granted. We don't think about that much because we take them for granted, but all of them are gifts from the Lord. And we need to be thankful. We need to think about them. We need to reflect upon them because He is the God of providence. He orders the events of the world and He orders the events of our lives every bit as much as He did when He commanded the waters of the Jordan to back up. He's powerful. He's able. He's absolutely involved in everything and He is faithful to us. The stones were memorials to remind Israel of that. Now in verses 10 through 13, the crossing is again described, and we read in verse 12 that the Transjordan tribes, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, crossed over in uh, battle array, ready to, to fight. A special note is given to their faithfulness to keep the promise that they made to Moses. You remember, they had conquered their lands on the east side of the Jordan, Transjordan. They had their inheritance, but they had promised that they would fight with the other tribes until they had received their complete inheritance as well. And so in verse 13, we read about 40,000 equipped for war, crossed for battle before the Lord, to the desert plains of Jericho. So these verses give us a picture of Israel united, acting together in obedience to God, acting in obedience to the Lord out of gratitude for what the Lord had done for them. And now all of this, the priests carrying the ark, uh, through all of this, they'd been standing there in this dry riverbed through this whole process holding the ark, and in doing that, holding back the waters. So following the, the crossing and the removal of the rocks, Joshua commanded the priests bearing the ark to come up from the Jordan. And verse 18 states, it came about when the priests 
who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had come up from the middle of the Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up to dry ground, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and went over all its banks as before. That must have been a spectacular sight, uh, and the, the precision of it would have, have only given proof of the supernatural, miraculous nature of the event, if that was even needed with these people. And just as the Jordan had dried up, the moment that the sole of the priest's feet touched the water, so too it rushed back to fill the banks with a roar after their feet reached Canaan. Calvin wrote, Thus the river, though dumb, was the best of heralds, proclaiming with a loud voice that heaven and earth are subject to the God of Israel. Now all of this was very providential. It happened, verse 19 states, on the 10th of the first month. On the 10th day of the first month of the year, of the year which on our calendar is March or April in that area. Now this is memorable because it was on that very day 40 years earlier that every Israelite chose a lamb for the Passover, four days before the Passover ceremony and the exodus from Egypt. So God providentially arranged the events so that the annual commemoration of the exodus and the Passover would also call to memory the nation's entrance into Canaan. It was all the work of God and a single work, an exodus from slavery and an entrance to freedom. Verse 20 says that Joshua then set up the 12 stones at Gilgal. When he had finished doing that, Joshua made a brief speech to the people, one that is largely the same as what he said earlier in uh, verses 6 and 7. But here Joshua impressed on the people the importance of the event by comparing it with the miracle at the Red Sea. He was one of the only ones left who had witnessed that event. Verse 23 for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever." So there are two purposes for the Lord dividing the Red Sea and drowning Pharaoh in it. First, to spread the name and fame of the Lord God throughout the earth. And secondly, to instill the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord in His people. And that's what the crossing of the Jordan did. It, it was a great miracle. And verse 14 says, it exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. That's what God had promised that he would do back in chapter 3 and verse 7. He would begin to exalt him among the people. And that happened. They revered him just as they had revered Moses. That was the effect of the miracle on Israel. Which is to say, they came to revere the Lord himself through the miracle that had taken place. They came to fear the Lord as a result of this great miracle. It had a very different effect on the Canaanites. In chapter 5, verse 1, we read that it caused them to be absolutely paralyzed with fear. Their hearts melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. So God prepared the land for conquest. In fact, before Israel fought a battle, the land was already theirs for the taking. That's what the Lord God does for His people. That's what David celebrated in Psalm 23. He makes our way straight. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He goes before us and He is always with us. This, this rock pile was a reminder of that. 
How unlike, how unlike man's monuments that was. Pharaohs raised obelisks to celebrate their conquests. In every age, monuments are raised to human achievement. This was different. It was a reminder of God's greatness, not man's. He brought the twelve tribes into the promised land to give them rest. He promised that. He did that. The people followed in faith, and they were blessed. The author of Hebrews gives us a lesson beyond just the historical event. He explains the meaning of all of this, the typology of this event, the, the spiritual meaning of it in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. He writes of salvation, of, of heaven and the world to come as rest. He calls it a Sabbath rest. That's what the land of Canaan represented. Heaven and the world to come, the kingdom to come. It's our inheritance which we enter through faith alone. Just as the twelve tribes entered the land. But it wasn't their faith that saves. It wasn't their faith that, that gives us salvation, gives us heaven, any more than it was faith, Israel's faith that gained the promised land for them. The Lord did that, symbolized by the ark in the river stopping the flood. The Lord made the nation's way into the land, and the Lord has opened up heaven for us. His way is the way. The Lord Himself is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father or enters heaven except through Him. He is the way as the crucified Savior who died in our place, paid for our sins, and doing that, wiped the slate clean, took away all our debts at that moment, and qualified us to come to the Father and have eternal life. That's how He opened up heaven for us. In fact, the connection between Israel's entrance into Canaan and our entrance into life and heaven is supported by the, the closeness on the calendar that I mentioned to you a moment ago of the Passover with the passing through in the Jordan. The Hebrews were, were freed from slavery in Egypt and gained the promised land by means of the blood of the Passover lamb. And the reminder of that for us is found in Christ. That's where we see the fulfillment of all of that that took place so long ago. It's in the Passover. It's in Christ who is the Passover, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Those things that occurred in ancient Israel picture what Christ has done for us. We have a, a, a monument for that very event. It's not like the marble monuments that men raise to themselves. Ours is simple and portable. We observe it wherever we go. It's the monument that Jesus established, the memorial that He set up the night that he was betrayed, the last night that he spent with the disciples when they celebrated the Passover, and there he established the Lord's Supper. He told his disciples, as often as they took it, that they were to do so in remembrance of me, in remembrance of our Lord. And when our children ask us about the bread and the wine, we should be able to explain to them what they signify the body and the blood of the Savior, who He is and what He did, and tell them about grace and power, tell them that the, the Lord is our sovereign Savior. How important it is to do that. How important it is to do that regularly. How important it is to do that weekly. It is, a, it is vitally important that we remember God's memorials are necessary for that. So may God help us never to forget what He has done for us. Always be grateful, 
always be in awe of his greatness, the greatness of all of his works and the greatness of his power, but certainly and most importantly, the greatness of his work of salvation in the cross of Calvary and his faithfulness to bring us to understand these things and to bless us and to help us all through this life. But remember, by way of warning, that the parents of those who crossed over in faith, who crossed over the Jordan into Canaan, the parents of those children didn't enter Canaan because of disobedience, because of unbelief. They instead wandered in the desert for 40 years until they all died the book of Psalms and the book of Hebrews have warnings about that. Because of the people's unbelief, God said, I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. They didn't. And if you're in unbelief, you're without eternal life. You will not enter the heavenly rest. Another end awaits you without rest or joy only sorrow eternally and darkness. Come to Christ. Believe in Him. Your faith doesn't save you, but your faith lays hold of that which does, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way across the Jordan into the promised land. It's the way to forgiveness of sin and life everlasting. God has done it all through the sacrifice of His own Son. All you must do to obtain the gift of life is receive it through faith. Believe in Him and live. May God help you to do that. Let's close with a word of prayer and thank the Lord for His sacrifice for us and prepare, ask Him to prepare our hearts for a time of remembering Him. Father, we, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. We reflect... <clears throat> Upon that, as we read this text in Joshua 4 and think of the great miracle you did for the nation, how you, as it were, moved heaven and earth to put them in the place that you promised to put them, that no obstacle could stand in the way of you fulfilling your promise and blessing them, putting them in the promised land which pictures for us the e eternal glorious future we have in heaven and the world to come and that you've made the way of entrance for us it's through the cross symbolized by that ark and the mercy seat covered with blood holding back the flood waters and you've done that for us through the cross of christ we who have laid hold of that cross and that salvation through faith and faith alone thank you for the work of salvation now, Father, as we take the Lord's Supper with the memorial that He set up for us, may we reflect deeply upon these things. May You teach us through the taking of these elements, the bread and the wine, that they testify to Your Son, who He is, that He became one of us. He became a man, perfect, yet human fully and completely. And He suffered as the spotless Lamb of God in our place and gained for us eternal life. Gained that for all of us who've laid hold of Him through faith alone. So Lord, build us up in the faith. We pray. We pray that You would bless us richly. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Going to read a passage like so many, all of these passages are familiar uh, to you that we read to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. This one's from Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. He, the, the Son of God, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, 
and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. These passages in our New Testaments that describe the character and attributes of Christ and from which Dan and I and the others have been reading these last few months for our Lord's Supper observances overlap with each other in some ways, yet each adds to what the others have to say to form a magnificent picture of who he is and what he has uh, done. And combined, they're like the finest diamond that as you hold it up and turn it and it catches the light, it displays brilliantly uh, the different facets of his beauty. And this one, out of the epistle to the, Corinth, uh, to, to the Colossians, features the exalted status of Christ Jesus. One of the most critical and important aspects of the person and work of Christ that equips us to remember, as Dan's sermon uh, has reminded us, that equips us to remember him fully is the one that we emphasize often, that is the infinite value of the sacrifice that Jesus made in the light of the supreme excellency and majesty of the one he offered, which was himself. And here in Colossians 1, we see that excellency laid out before us. Paul states that he is the image of the invisible God. That means that he is the exact likeness of God, fully God in every way. Further, he is the firstborn of all creation. That means he has the highest rank, he, the supreme heir of all creation. He goes on to say he himself is the creator. Everything has been created by him and for him. Uh, he is before all things, meaning he existed before even creation. He is the eternal God. And all things subsist or hold together in him. Uh, every molecule and atom perform their duties because of his almighty power. And we could go on and parse every a phrase of these verses, but Paul summarizes them in the 19th verse by saying that it pleased the Father for all the fullness of deity to dwell in him. And that gives him infinite value and is the reason Paul can conclude his ode of praise by marveling how by him God has reconciled all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And we who are sinners and at enmity with our great God have been reconciled to him on account of the excellency of his offering on the cross. And consequently, we have peace with God. And that's something to celebrate. Uh, you, we know it in our hearts. Uh, that is something to celebrate. And we have that opportunity now, as we participate together in the Lord's Supper, taking of this bread and of this wine, it reminds us, as he told us, that this is his body given for us. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we want you and invite you to participate with us in the supper. Uh, we remember when we take the cup that he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. He inaugurated a new covenant and we enjoy the blessings of it and the forgiveness of sins. So we invite you now uh, to pay heed to the things that have been said and, and in your heart give thanks to him. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, thank you for this emblem 
which is a reminder, symbolically at least, that you are a great God and your love is beyond comprehension, that you would offer yourself upon the cross at Calvary for us and take upon yourself the penalty for our sins, which we deserved, and instead you took the penalty upon yourself so that we might emerge with you in a resurrection life and live forever. We're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read Psalm 77, not the entire psalm. I'm going to begin with verse 7 and read through verse 15, and then make a few comments that relate <clears throat> to our passage in Joshua and also to the Lord's Supper. I think it's appropriate because this is a psalm in which Asaph remembers. Remembers what the Lord did. To use Mark's uh, expression, he, uses, he remembers the Lord's excellencies, but it doesn't begin that way. It's somewhat like Psalm 73, where Asaph begins in despair. The wicked are prospering, and here he speaks in kind of despairing terms as well. Read in verse 7, Will the Lord reject forever? And will He never be favorable again? Has His loving kindness ceased forever? Has, he promised, has His promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or has His anger withdrawn His compassion? Then I said, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. But then a change comes in the psalm in verse 11. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. So this despairing psalmist comes to a change when he begins to remember. It's important for us to do that as I, I tried to emphasize in my sermon to you. We need to make memorials in our minds. We need to remember the things that the Lord has done, the great things that He has done, but more importantly, remember the greatest deeds of the Lord, as the psalmist does. Remember His wonders of old, but remember the greatest deed that the psalmist comes to in verse 15, and that is that He redeemed His people. The God who can do all the things that He did can do that, and only the God who created the universe, who sustains the universe, every molecule and atom, as Mark pointed out, as Paul points out in Colossians 1, only he could bring about salvation. That's what he's done. He's, he achieved salvation for his people at the cross of Calvary so that all one must do is simply receive it. Your works can't accomplish that. You can only receive it, and as we know by the grace of God, you can only receive it through faith. So we need to remember that. We need to remember that often. It's vitally important for our spiritual health, so it's good that we're here and good that we're doing that. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, thank you for this cup. The cup itself, of course, is nothing. It's, it's a memorial of what is important, and that is the blood of your Son, which is to say the shedding of His blood, which is to say His sacrifice for us. Thank You for sending Him into the world to die for us. Thank You, Lord Jesus, for coming willingly into this world to die for us and doing so, as the author of Hebrews says, with the joy set before You. And we're grateful for the Spirit of God who gave us the faith and drew us to the cross. Bless this, Lord, as we take this memorial. Help us to remember and think deeply as we do about your Son and what He did for us. In Christ's name, amen. Let's conclude our service with the benediction.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. May the Lord help us each to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith throughout the week. See you next week, hopefully.